I am reading Tony Dungy's book, Quiet Strength, and I came across a little episode in that book. Tony Dungy was the first black coach to win a Super Bowl with the Indianapolis Colts, but more importantly, he is a fine Christian with a great testimony for the Lord. And he tells of an episode early in his career that I think leads into what we're talking about here in Hebrews 10. He tells the story of his second year as a professional football player. And he played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. The year was 1978. During training camp that year, he was sick with mononucleosis. And he missed the first three weeks. And as a young reserve... He worried that he might be cut from the team. And so he expressed his worries to his roommate, Donnie Shell. Tony, I think you're at a crossroads, Donnie Shell said. You know what life is all about. You profess to be a Christian, and you tell everybody that God has first place in your life. Now, when your career looks like it is teetering, we're getting a chance to see what really is first place for you. Tony replied, you're probably right. All of a sudden, I come to a crisis point in my life, and I begin to panic. My thoughts turn to, what am I going to do? Donnie Shell paused and measured him carefully, and then he said, all the Lord is trying to do is to find out what's in first place in your life. And right now, it looks like football is. Tony Dungy said he felt totally convicted by that conversation as a young player. And he decided that whatever happened, he wanted God to be first in his life. So he started praying and asking God to help him to make sure that God always was first in everything. He did make the team. He recovered and made the team that year. The Steelers went 14-2 and and won the Super Bowl. And Tony Junji led the team in interceptions. The next year, he was traded to the last place team in the league. And he said that if it happened the year before, he probably couldn't have handled it. But now he knew that God was first place in his life, no matter what happened in his career. And that's a lesson we all must learn. Christ calls us to live for him because he died for us. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 this morning. That's the passage we're looking at. Hebrews 10, 19 begins a transition. It is a transition passage from the the doctrinal or theological part of the book of Hebrews to the practical part of the book of Hebrews, if we can say it that way. It is a transition or a hinge in the book, in the letter of Hebrews. He has been talking about the supremacy of Christ the necessity of the cross, and all of that for our faith. And now he is going to talk about, all right, what does that mean for our lives? What does that mean for you and me in the stuff you face in life this week, this year, right now, in your careers, in your families, in your jobs, in your personal life? Christ calls us to live for him. We must learn that our careers, our possessions, our families, our health, our ambitions, our dreams, everything else is secondary to Christ. We must learn to live for Him. Christ calls us to live for Him, to put Him first in all that we do. He gave his life for us. He calls us to give our lives to him. There are three exhortations in this passage. And if you're prone to mark your Bibles, you can circle the little words, let us, in verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24. This is the let us passage. So let us, three times he exhorts us, 
how to live. We should, first of all, draw near to God boldly. Verse 19. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to God. The Greek word means to approach God closely. We don't have to stay at a distance from God. God doesn't want to be distanced from you or from me. He wants us to be near Him. The word was used in the first century religious world for coming near the presence of a deity in the temple, approaching the the deity in the temple. Well, God wants us to draw near to Him with a sincere heart. The, The word means a true or a genuine or authentic heart. God doesn't want fake spirituality. We can put that on in church. God doesn't want pretend piety. We can make everybody else think we're very pious and we're very spiritual, but God sees right through all of that. He wants an authentic heart. He wants genuineness. He wants us to be real when we draw near to Him. So we can talk to God in prayer at any time and any place. We don't need priests. We don't need pastors to be the intermediaries for us. God is as near as you want him to be. Anytime, anywhere, any place. But when we come to God in prayer, God wants us to come to him authentically. He doesn't want us to, to put on airs, to be artificial. I mean, too many prayers are artificial. It's a huge occupational hazard with preachers, you know, to to put on the preacher prayer, to talk to God in what amounts to an artificial way. When we talk to God, prayer is just talking real, being real with God. It's telling Him what what we feel, what we think. We don't have to have special words to do that. We don't even have to be eloquent to do that. God doesn't want all of that. Be real when you pray. Be real when you talk to God. Just like you would talk to any other close friend. Tell him what is on your mind. That's real prayer. The second qualification for drawing near to God is that God wants us to come to him with confidence. He wants us to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. We should come to God in a state of complete certainty, full assurance that God is ready and willing to listen to us. Just as we are, we are to draw near to God boldly then. Now, how do we do this with God? On what basis can we come to God with that kind of authenticity, with that kind of boldness? What is the basis for our bold prayers? Well, four foundational truths give us that basis this morning. Allow us to come in confidence to God in prayer. Every Christian can have this kind of confidence that God listens to us when we pray based upon these four foundational truths. We have a perfect sacrifice. We have a perfect sacrifice. Verse 19. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is, that is his flesh. The Old Testament Israelites, in order to enter the tabernacle, the holy place in the tabernacle, the priests were the only ones who could enter that tabernacle, and they represented the rest of the Israelites. 
Only priests could enter that holy place. And after Christ died to pay for our sins, we can all enter the holy place of God with confidence. The word confidence was used of being bold or fearless before a top government official like the President of the United States. Can you be bold and outspoken? The word meant to be outspoken or frank, to speak your mind, right? Before the President of the United States. Even greater before Almighty God to be able to speak our mind, to say exactly what we want before God. We don't have to be politically correct with God. We don't have to frame our words just right. We can be open, frank, and bold when we pray. Why? Because Christ has opened the door to God's presence anytime we want to enter His holy place. The blood of Christ provides a new and living way into the very presence of God. We don't have to come to God in a special place like the tabernacle. We can come to God directly anytime, any place. We can come frankly and boldly into His presence, and it's all because Christ has died for us. And His blood has inaugurated our entrance into God's holy presence. That is absolutely incredible, isn't it? That the Almighty God of this universe the creator of everything that is, is glad for you to enter his presence, for me to enter his presence on the basis of what Christ has done for us. So the first foundational truth is a perfect sacrifice. The second is a great high priest. We have a great high priest in verse 21. And for that reason, we can enter His holy presence. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. So, we don't have to come to God through priests, through holy people who represent us to God. We don't have to do that anymore. We can come to God just as we are, wherever we are. God wants you to draw near to Him. So you can talk to, you can talk directly to God not through an intermediary. For Jesus Christ is your high priest, my high priest. He is the only intermediary we need. We come to God through Jesus Christ. That's the only person you need to come to God through, is Christ. We don't need human holy people go between us and God. For Jesus Christ is our go-between. So you need to talk to God through Christ, yes, but He's the only intermediary. Third, we can draw near to God boldly because we have a purified conscience. Verse 22, let us draw near with with an authentic heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. All right, sin is the barrier between unholy people like us and a holy God. In the Old Testament, the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the mercy seat of God in the Holy of Holies as payment for that sin so that people could come and enter God's presence, come to God. A guilty conscience is what keeps us from drawing near to God. When we feel guilty over what we have done in life, that guilty conscience keeps us from drawing near to God. Jesus Christ has purified that guilty conscience by His blood. Christ's blood has been sprinkled on our hearts to purify us and allow us to enter God's holy presence. So we no longer need to have a guilty conscience. For we come to God having our immoral consciousness, which is the concept here, purified by His blood. Every every person has a consciousness of their immorality in life of their sinfulness, of their unholiness. Everyone does. It's built into human nature. Now, some people dull that consciousness 
by busying themselves with all sorts of things in life. Other people try to ignore that that consciousness of our own sinfulness and our own, own, our own unholiness. Just kind of put it out of our minds, deny it, ignore it. But every single person sins. I sin, you sin. Everyone sins. Everyone has a consciousness of that guilt. The only way to get rid of that immoral consciousness is to accept the blood of Christ as your payment for sin. A guilty conscience can only be purified by the blood of Christ. Once we come to God on that basis, well, then we can pray openly and boldly. And God listens to our prayers because we have a purified conscience. And finally, it's because we have a sanctified life. Verse 23 again. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil or immoral conscience or consciousness and our bodies washed with pure water. Right, so it's not just our hearts that have to be purified, but our bodies have been washed with pure water. Now, this is imagery again. And it is drawn, once again, from the Old Testament sacrificial system. There were two important items outside of the holy place, outside of the tabernacle, that provided entrance into the holy place. The first was the altar where the blood of the sacrifice was collected. You know, they slaughtered the bull or the goat and they collected that blood and then they took that blood into the holy place to sprinkle it and make make cleansing, make atonement for sin. That was the first. But there was another item outside, right outside of the holy place in the tabernacle door, and it was the bronze laver. And the priests would wash their bodies in the, in the water out of that bronze laver before they went into the tabernacle because they were cleansing their lives symbolically now, of course, in order to enter God's presence. Well, our lives have to be sanctified or are cleansed in order to enter God's holy presence. And he's telling us they have been. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul wrote, He saved us not on the basis of our works, which we have done in righteousness. It's not on our good works that he saves us but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And in Ephesians 5.26, we're told that Jesus sanctified us, having cleansed us by the washing of the water with His Word. It is Christ who sanctifies us. So when our lives have been sanctified, by the washing of regeneration, that is the new birth, the new life that we have in God, and the Word of God cleanses us, we can come boldly to God in prayer. That opens things up. We can now be open and frank with God. We can draw near to God in prayer on the basis of these foundational truths because we have a perfect sacrifice, because we have a great high priest, because we have a purified conscience, and because we have a sanctified life, all by what God has done for us. Now we can come boldly to God in prayer. Emma Daniel Gray died on June 8th, 2009, at the age of 95. So that's almost a year ago now. There was a big story about her in the Washington Post. Because for 24 years, she was the woman who cleaned the office of the President of the United States of America. She served six different presidents. Six different administrations, six different presidents, till she retired in 1979. Her official title? Charwoman. I didn't know anybody was called a charwoman anymore. That's her title, or was her title. What made the story even more interesting was that Mrs. Gray, Emma Gray, was a 
very committed Christian. She would stand and pray over the president's chair each time she was in the Oval Office to clean it. She dusted it. Her cleaning supplies in one hand, the other hand on the back of the president's chair. And she'd pray for blessings, for wisdom, for safety, no matter which president sat in that chair. While reflecting on the way she lived life, her pastor said at her funeral, she saw life through the eyes of promise. She saw life through the eyes of promise. You can always look around and find reasons to be unhappy. But you couldn't be around her and not know what she believed. Well, isn't that what Christians are supposed to do? Live life through the eyes of promise? That's how we pray. Boldly. For the President of the United States. That's a holy place right there. And it's not holy because of who's in the presidency or who isn't. It's not holy because it's the Oval Office. Why is it holy? Because a dusting woman prayed boldly in that location. That's why it's the holy place. Secondly, let us hang on to the hope tenaciously. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, the correct word used here is hope, not faith. If you have a King James, it'll say faith here, but it is hope. We have a hope in Christ that transcends this world. Let's hold fast to that hope throughout life. Now, the verb means, the the verb hold fast means to keep in our possession, to retain this hope faithfully. Then we can do this because the one who promises us that hope is completely reliable. He's the one who's faithful, right? Christ is faithful. He will keep his promises to us so we have a sure hope that we can hang on to no matter what happens in life. And I like the way this is expressed in this verse. Notice that literally we are to hang on to the confession of the hope rather than the hope itself. Hope can be somewhat vacuous, sort of wishful thinking. That's why it's so important not just to have a wishful sort of ambiguous hope that we really can't truly articulate, we can't really express to anyone. That kind of hope can never be verified. It can never be tested because it's just sort of wishy, right? Many people live in this world with that sort of hope-so mentality. It's the power of positive thinking that Norman Vincent Peale made so popular years ago. People think that if you just sort of wish positive thoughts, that everything will be fine. But wishing positive thoughts doesn't fix anything. The hope of the Bible is not positive thinking. It's not just wishing sort of ambiguous wishes and hopes. And staying positive, the hope of the Bible can be defined, it can be articulated, Christ's hope can be tested, Christ's hope can be confessed, professed, announced. Our hope is what? The return of Christ and life forever with Him. That's our hope. We can confess that, we can announce that, it can be tested It's very specific. It can be defined. Our hope is that Jesus Christ wins the victory over all the mess of this world and we enjoy new life with Him forever. That's our hope. And this confession of hope is what we are to hang on to no matter what happens. We are to confess this hope. We are to put it into words 
And once we put this hope into words, it becomes something tangible that we can hang on to in life. So let us hang on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Sometimes it feels like we haven't got a whole lot to hang on to. Express it. Put it into words. Make it tangible and then hang on without wavering. It's kind of an interesting word. It means without faltering, without, you know, going back and forth in any way. No wavering in this. You just hang on to the confession you make of your hope in Jesus Christ. He will get you through, right? He wins, no matter what you're facing. You hang on to that hope. Express it. Confess it. Make it tangible. Make it real. And then believe it. Since the death of Pastor Fred Winters last year, Cindy Winters has heard stories from lots of individuals about how, where they were and what was happening when they heard that her husband had been shot. Cindy Winters shared her story at her church this past March, a little about two months ago, I guess. One day before the first anniversary of her husband's death, she said, did you ever wonder where God was on March 8th? This would have been March 8th, 2009. She's obviously the widowed mother of two young children now. They were holding a special commemorative service for her husband's death. She says, God was in that dark room with me. That's where God was. She said, recalling the hospital room where she waited immediately following the death of her husband. God was providing us with a sense of peace. And I really believe that God was right next to Fred that day and took him home to heaven. You probably remember the story on March 8, 2009, 45-year-old Fred Winters was shot through the heart by 27-year-old Terry Sedlicek as Fred was preaching to his congregation in a normal morning worship service. On Sunday, Cindy Winters avoided talking about the accused shooter, but she made sure to point to the one she held responsible for her husband's death. As I sat there in the family waiting room, there was a point when God spoke to me, Winters said, recalling her wait in what she called the darkest room I've ever been in in my entire life. And God said, Cindy, what happened here was sheer evil, and it was orchestrated by Satan. And I said out loud, and I could have very well sounded pretty crazy to whoever was in the room at the time, I said out loud, then Satan will not win. He will not win. Now that is a confession of hope. It's expressed, it's tangible, it's articulated, it's defined. Satan will not win. He will not win. Since that tragedy, Winter says she and her family have been able to gain a sense of perspective. Sometimes our focus, she said, becomes so set on our circumstances right here and now. But there's something that's real, more real than here and now, and it's called heaven. It's called eternity. Is heaven more real to you than here and now? It was to her. And while focusing on heaven, she said, doesn't take away the pain of the here and now. It puts things into perspective because there's hope in chaos. There's peace in the storm, and there's joy in the circumstances. She wrapped up her presentation to their church family by telling the the folks that while March 8, 2009 was a horrible day for her and for many others, it wasn't for her husband. He is more alive than any of us sitting here right now in this room, she stated to the church's applause. And one day I'm going to meet him at the gate of heaven, and it is my hope and my prayer that I'll meet you there too. Now that's tangible hope. There's nothing wishy-washy about that hope. That's expressed, it's defined, and she's hanging on to it. And that's what God calls all of us to do. And finally, let us arouse one another lovingly. Verses 24 to 25. 
Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Orthodox church officials in Russia discovered in 2008 that one of their church buildings had disappeared. The 200-year-old building northeast of Moscow had been unused, gone unused for, for over a decade. But the Orthodox Church was going to reopen this church building. And when they showed up, the building wasn't there anymore. So they wanted to find out what happened to their church building. I mean, if you know anything about Russian Orthodox churches, they're rather substantial, right? After investigating the manner that the the church officials didn't blame aliens or some other weird solution to this, they discovered that it had been the villagers from a nearby village. They, They had taken one by one the bricks and they had sold the bricks to a local businessman for one ruble each. That's about four cents a brick. This two-story church building didn't go away because some bulldozer bulldozed it down. The bricks were taken one brick at a time by lots and lots of people until the church was gone. You know what? In the same way, some churches built not of bricks because the church is people, living stones, Christians. But some churches disappear the same way, one brick at a time. Choosing not to be involved Choosing to go other ways, other places. Maybe stay home, watch that TV preacher. Read the Bible, pray by ourselves. We don't need the church. I mean, after all, who wants to mess with the organized church? Do your own spiritual thing. It's lots easier. Each decision means one brick removed from the church. And in the end, the church that God intended to honor himself is gone. One person at a time. People need to get plugged into church. We all need to connect with one another to serve, to grow together. Christianity is not a Lone Ranger lifestyle. We need each other to grow spiritually. So the author says, let us think carefully about one another in order to provoke one another to love and good deeds. The verb means to stimulate, to stir up one another. In fact, it's the Greek word from which we get our English word paroxysm. That's a convulsion. We're supposed to create convulsions in one another. We're to create good convulsions in each other so that we produce love and good works. How does that work? Well, it means that we are to watch out for those, he says, who are abandoning or forsaking the assembling, the gathering together, as is the habit of some. We're to look around and see who is turning away from church, who is slipping away or no longer coming to church. And we are to stimulate them or provoke them, (laughs) not in a bad way, in a good way. To stop turning away from the assembly of believers and to show love and good works to produce a life that is worthy of God. The tendency of churches is to think that's the, that the task of provoking others is the job of the preacher. <laughs> and so it's the job of the preacher to go around and, 
and stimulate others to stir them up so they get involved. And it's certainly part of the job, right? But that's not the point of this passage at all. The target here is every single Christian. Every single Christian. Not just the preacher. But every single Christian, everyday ordinary Christians, are to watch out for one another and provoke one another if necessary whenever we see this sort of slippage happening. In fact, oftentimes you will know long before a preacher knows what is going on in a friend's life or a family member's life and the slippage that is taking place. And the job of every Christian is to address a fellow believer whenever we see this happening. Turning away from church, not gathering with other believers in church, is a sign that there is something wrong in the heart. Furthermore, it can become habit-forming because it becomes habitual not to go to church. So, he says, let us arouse one another lovingly in our fellowship so that we don't disappear one brick at a time. That's the negative side. The positive side is encouragement. We are to encourage or exhort one another to be faithful. That's also our job. Not just to provoke or stimulate, but to encourage one another. Lots of times people need encouragement, don't they? Coming alongside of someone and just encouraging and picking up their spirits and getting them going again. And he says, we are to do so even more as we see the day approaching. See, our eyes are always thinking of the promise, the hope, right? Christ is coming. And as we see that day approaching, we ought to even more come alongside and encourage one another in the fellowship of believers to show love and good works in our lives. So, this is the life God calls us to live. God calls us to a new and living way, the way of Christ. We are to live for Him because He died for us. He gave His life. Draw near to God boldly, hang on to the hope tenaciously, and arouse one another lovingly. That's the new and living way that we as Christians are to follow. That's what God calls us to do. A 2009 article in the Chicago Tribune told the story of Betty Tucker. Betty Tucker is a Christian cook who works the night shift at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. She's been doing her job for 43 years. 28 of those years she's worked the night shift. She sees a steady stream of parents in her job at the Children's Memorial Hospital, many of them frightened and tired, coming into the cafeteria late at night, in the middle of the night. On one particular night, Miss Betty, as that's what she's called, served food to a mother whose three-year-old fell out of a second-story window that morning, another mother whose 17-year-old was battling a rare form of leukemia, and a third mother whose 18-year-old had endured seven hours of brain surgery that day. And on and on it went. Their stories break her heart. And one co-worker says that's why Miss Betty feeds every last one of them as if they had walked right into the too small kitchen of the south side brick bungalow where she lives. A member of the hospital's housekeeping crew adds this, you need someone to bring you life and she brings it in the middle of the night. There's a picture of Miss Betty in the article shows a woman with a beautiful smile. Hard to imagine how much that smile would mean to a suffering mom or dad or child. She says, when I ask how you're doing and they say it's not a good day, I say, don't lose hope. When the nurses tell me it's a bad night, I say, I understand it's a bad night, but guess what? I'm here for you. Another picture shows her sitting down and praying. I'm a praying lady, she says in the article. I pray every night. Now listen to this. I pray for every room and every person in the hospital. I start with the basement, and I go up. 
floor by floor, room by room. I pray for the children. I pray for the families. I pray for the nurses and the doctors. I say every night while I'm driving in on the expressway, Oh Lord, I don't know what I'll face tonight, but I pray you'll guide me through. Wow. That's a praying lady, all right. The reporter, Barbara Mahaney, who wrote the article, concluded the article with these words. Just might be, That divine helping on the side is the most essential item on Miss Betty's menu, you think? The one she stirs into every broth and every whisper. The ingredient that makes her the perpetual light shining in the all-night kitchen. Mm. Now that's living for God. Father, teach us that no matter how menial no matter how minor it seems that our lives are in the scheme of this world's system. We live for you. We offer your hope and your grace to others. We come boldly into your presence and speak frankly to you about the needs that we see. And we encourage one another We pray for one another, and we hold fast to the hope that you have promised to us. In Jesus' name, amen.